So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr Lillian Nandy, and I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to give a talk at Europython 2022 in Dublin and you, the audience, for being here. The title of my talk is Creating the Next Generation of Billionaires, Part 4, Using Python. So as this is a continuation of parts 1, 2 and 3, allow me to quickly bring you up to speed with a synopsis of the previous talks. So coding, computer programming, is now regarded as many by an essential skill for any aspiring, ambitious, self-respecting young citizen in an aspiring nation. And as such, it has been dubbed the fourth R, along with reading, writing and arithmetic. In recognition of this new status of computer programming, governments worldwide have launched initiatives to have it taught in schools starting at the beginning of the school career in kindergarten through to junior school and all the way through to secondary school. And the regions in red are where this is deemed to be happening. So I, for the past few years, have had appointments to actively lead and introduce computer programming to children aged 11 to 18 in UK schools. And in doing so, I wanted to make it interesting, fun, educational, and also motivate them properly. Okay. So now embarking upon this venture, it came as an extremely pleasant surprise to discover that young people are generally extremely interested in the subject and they really do want to learn it. Coding has very positive associations with space rockets, driverless cars, robots, etc., and they can see a great future associated with it. Whereas the challenges in the venture were, suffice to say, the establishment's reaction is somewhat lukewarm. Also, as The Economist rightly points out, the subject is so young that teachers and curriculum designers have little pedagogical research to guide them. To put this into context, if we look at other subjects such as maths, English, history, geography, these have been taught for hundreds and thousands of years all over the globe. So there's a great deal of collective experience and knowledge on how best they should be taught, how best people should learn them. In contrast, computer programming has only been around for the past few years and there's little collective experience knowledge about the teaching and learning of them so with a dearth of pedagogy i decided to develop my own framework now in developing my own framework certain key decisions had to be taken. The first key decision that is, do we introduce a block-based language or a textual-based language? We decided to introduce a textual-based language for every single age group right from the start. We decided the language should be Python as it is the number one teaching language in schools at universities and the students would be in good company. And the rationale behind it was at the age of 11, children in English learn William Shakespeare. In maths, they solve simultaneous equations. In geography, they write about the merits and demerits of excessive carbon footprints. So at these ages, they are mentally prepared to process textual data successfully. Yes, visual languages are very helpful, but we also felt textual languages are also enjoyable and within their intellectual remit. Second key decision is what approach should we be used in teaching coding? Should we employ a bottom-up approach or go for a top-down approach? Decision was made to introduce computer programming using a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. The bottom up approach is a tried, tested, successful, traditional method it used in teaching computer programming to adults. Foreign languages and mathematics have also been taught in this manner traditionally. And in this approach, the concepts and operational definitions of the concepts are taught before they're applied to a problem. Now, this is not the only way of teaching. It's not un at all unusual that this is a somewhat alien approach to the modern school student who can could have predominantly been taught by a top-down approach whereby the problem is specified and they then delve further, delve further to see what tools are available to solve the problem. However, the approach was well received. 
This was then preceded with an explanation that programs are analogous to essays, programming languages to sentences, keywords analogous to words. We would therefore be learning about a word, key word at a time and learn about its uses before building it up in due course to create more complex programs. The students appear to like this explanation and buy into the bottom-up concept. And from time to time, I was asked by the students questions such as, are you fluent in the Python language? Indeed, parents mentioned in Parents' Evening how much their children were enjoying and loving the language. The third key decision was could we or should we use traditional coding examples to demonstrate concepts, or should we create child-friendly, age-appropriate examples? We decided to use traditional coding examples and see how they are received by the children. We use standard mathematical examples to demonstrate concepts. For example, the children were shown a for loop to generate odd numbers. Very soon, they gleefully wrote their own for loops to generate their own sequences, and they were absolutely delighted. This is something which they are learning about in maths, and they find it fascinating. Another favorite program of theirs was the generation of multiplication tables. But the program which generated the most excitement was to sum consecutive numbers, one to a million. That's one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way to a million. The children were amazed by how quickly the computer could compute the answer to you know, what large numbers it could deal with and the simplicity of the method. The excitement was quite something to behold, and something which is relatively unexciting for an adult is really exciting for a child. Alex, age 12, commented, the for loop, I like it particularly because it does all the laborious calculations so quickly and saves a lot of time. Also, elimin code eliminates human mistakes which could arise out of boredom of doing the same task over and over again. So, we had a good degree of success from this approach, with both comments from students and parents about how much the children were enjoying the subject. We found that year seven, that's 11-year-olds, are better than year eight, which are 12-year-olds, who seem to be better than 13-year-olds, who seem to be better than 14-year-olds, who seem to be better than 15-year-olds. So starting properly from the beginning is better. The students were also quite happy with this teacher-led approach rather than a student-led approach or independent learning at this beginning stage. And of course, the best students are the ones that are motivated to do well in the subject. And as educator, we found that a congenial home atmosphere is extremely beneficial. So, after establishing the success of the method, we felt that children had developed a solid foundation. We began to think of how to proceed further with all of this. We felt that we should be using Python to look at and analyze real-world situations, and using Python to look at various aspects of climate change came to mind. Now, in embarking on this venture, we felt that we'd be able to maintain the educational integrity of all of this. We'd be putting our energies into and time into an educational and worthy topic, and we'd be able to make use of commonly used Python data visualization libraries, such as matplotlib. So let me take you on a journey of what we did here. So... In the first instance, we just wanted to get going with matplotlib. So the first exercise was to create a prob program to plot a straight line graph of the form y equals mx plus c with the given coordinates. The young people managed this successfully, see figure one. And 13 and 14 year olds do this in maths anyway. So to automate it, it delighted them. Exercise two. We're always hearing about our huge carbon footprint and how we should reduce it. We're told that the population is responsible for this. So let's look at the population of the G7 countries, C figure two. Young people were struck by the huge difference in the populations of Canada and US, two neighboring countries with the same land mass. Of course, we need a reference frame and the G7 countries form about 9% of the world's population. They then did an exercise three to construct pie charts showing the relative populations of the G7 countries. And here they were st struck by the fact that you can, you know, explode 
segments in matplotlib you can put percentages on something which you really can't do manually and they also wrote code to um, generate figure 3b which shows the um, world the relative world population according to the uh, of the g7 according to the total population which is nine that nine percent exercise four they created constructed programs for bar charts showing the landmass of the G7 countries. They were struck by how similar the landmass of Canada and US were. And for comparative purposes, GS, G7 countries occupy about 4% of the total global landmass, and they did calculate that. For exercise five, they constructed programs for bar charts which show the carbon dioxide output for G7 countries. Again, they were struck by the huge uh, carbon dioxide of the US far outstripping other nations. In fact, the G7, and they calculated G7 countries' um, output is about 25, 27% of the world total carbon dioxide output. They looked at it a bit further. Exercise six, they constructed, um, the young people constructed programs looking at carbon dioxide output in terms of population of the country. Here we see from another view that C Canada appears to rank second in the stakes. And if you compare the sort of, uh, do a comparison of carbon dioxide output of G7 countries compared to the average world uh, total output, you, um, the, it's interesting to note that the ratio is about 2.27. A rather precocious child commented, if the average carbon dioxide output consumption of G7 countries is encouraged and replicated for all countries of the world, the world will surely perish within 10 years. And finally, last but not least, the young people looked at carbon dioxide emissions versus land mass, and we get a different um, story here. We get a normal distribution with the Germany, UK and Japan centres and the US and the Canada at the outskirts. And uh, again, if we sort of compare this to a metric comparison compared to the world, it's about 18 times more. So, yeah, to conclude, the young people saw by using Python for real world examples that data, big data, is a big window of transparency onto the world. And it helps them to understand real world situation. Why research? Why continued research? Well, it teaches the teacher, young people, how to interact and respond to newly arising problems and situation. Such exercises enable young people to build a more comprehensive, holistic and balanced view of the world. More importantly, such activities motivate young people to learn about computer coding. The classroom lessons should be done in conjunction with computer coding clubs in school and also outings to external seminars around about the real world applications such as climate change, financial markets and medical research. So let us finish with some quotes, ideas from Plato about um, education, ideas which we have great respect for and we endeavour to implement. And these are the beginning is the most important part of the work. Education is teaching our children to desire the right things. Thank you very much for listening and your time. Thank you so much, Lillian, for um, operating in a much more constrained time schedule as well. So thank you so much. Um, guys, now we have time for a Q&A. Uh, we're just ahead of schedule, actually, by, um, well, we're just on schedule. It'll be five minutes. Do we have anybody in the room who'd like to ask a question or anybody remotely? Nobody remote? Great. So you can take, <clears throat> you, you can queue up just behind this microphone here. Thank you. Hi. Um, could you tell us how you compared different approaches? Like you, you said, you, uh, you you talked about bottom up and top down. Um, did you do one class of one and one class with another? Um, I'm a teacher myself. I can't get my head around how you would work on that kind of scale with uh, comparing things scientifically. Okay. I I didn't do one class with another or an, another class with another. But however, having said that, I have observed other classes um, with, say, a top-down approach. I am... Um, I'm not convinced 
how it's actually working. But I, I felt I felt more in you know I just delved in. I felt more intuitively that a bottom up approach would work. It's the way that I've been taught. It's the way that we learn languages. It's the way we learn music. It's the way that I've learned mathematics, and I know how to implement it, and I know how to make it work, um, and I've seen it working. So I decided to go for that approach and to see whether it works or not, and I, f I found that it did, basically. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was excellent. Um, I, I'm curious, I, I have my own kids that are around 8 to, to 11 years old, and I'm curious about, um, you mentioned the block-based learning versus just strictly text-based learning, or if there have been, if they can use them in conjunction with each other, because there's so much gamification of learning how to code these days, and uh, writing kind of pseudo code, and, and understanding the, the, the concepts behind programming that seem to really, the kids really get interested in, like developing their own games and things of that nature, um, versus just kind of jumping right into writing text-based. If there was um, uh, studies been done about both approaches, or using both approaches in conjunction with each other. Okay, um, I have not actually come across with both approaches in conjunction with each other. I have come across uh, students being introduced to block-based language first. Um, I can only be, I can only really say anecdotally, to be honest, you know. And I, th I feel that block-based languages, they're good, but they're maybe more introduced for ease of implementation. You know, you can't get a syntax error. You can only get blocks which, um, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, really. And so I feel for more administrative purposes, it can be quite good. Um, I don't know how it's received on the other end, to put it this way. Put it mildly. I haven't met a child yet who is complementing block-based learning, okay. and you know the the child, even you know different ability range spectrum, children on different ranges of the spectrum. I've never come across one who has complemented it. To put it mildly. So therefore, you know, I went for um, textual base. I know they can cope with text because they're reading, they're writing, they're doing maths, and they cope very well, and they feel as if they're doing something grown up and worthy. It, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, guys, we've less than two minutes left, but still time for another question. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was really nice. Uh, it's been a while. I'm out of school, but uh, in traditional subjects, it was that you are not really encouraged to take the try and error approach. And uh, like I was wondering how kids were, uh, if there are some struggles with trying different paths to the same results and just playing with the code. Which the is challenges? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I gave them worked examples. You know, so a work, a work, a very s small worked example of a code, and then they write a code which is very similar to the worked example kind of thing. So they have, so what you're doing is you're imprinting a structure in their mind. And they're not, first of all, making something up from scratch. They are having the structure just in the same way as they're learning to read. They read and They've got imprinted in their mind sentences and paragraphs, and then they construct sentences and paragraphs of their own. They seem to kind of like the approach as such. Um, and, you know, giving them a structure, quite, I, I didn't think they would be typing in the worked examples, but they all typed in the worked examples and managed to get it running, and it gives them a sense of achievement. So I think they feel you know, with small programs, they can get sense of achievement, and they seem to like that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lily. I'm afraid it's a hard stop there, guys. We need to prepare for the next t talk. Uh, but thank you, Lily, for coming today. Really appreciate your time, and thank you all, uh, both in person and virtually as well. Take care. <laughs>